Sue, so you've been practicing uh, Buddhist meditation for about 30 years, and there's one quote by the Buddha that particularly interests you, and it resonates with your work. The quote is, actions do exist, and also their consequences, but the person, person that acts does not. But the person who acts does not. The quote by the Buddha, there exists no individual, it is only a conventional name given to a set of elements. Your comments, please. <laughs> Just wasn't wasn't he brilliant? I mean, he sat there under the tree and saw this. That's a statement that could come right out of modern neuroscience. Um, that there are actions. Of course, they have consequences. If this body does something, you know, uh, jumps at you, whatever it might do, there are consequences to that. And we naturally assume that the reason for the action is somebody inside who has free will, who is controlling this body. That's a fantasy. As the Buddha put it, of course in a totally different context, it's just a set of elements. He, he likened it to a carriage with parts. Nowadays we would say, you know, it's made of, of, of the uh, elements in the periodic table and, and neurons in the brain and so on, but it's exactly the same idea. Mm. Look inside the brain, you do not find the little me. You do not find a central place where I could be. You find a mechanism constructing an illusion. Right. And what impact does that have on people's lives when they live their life from the point of illusion? When they live from the point of illusion, well, the Buddha's view that is that that's the origin of greed, hatred and suffering. I think that's pretty close to the truth. It doesn't have to be so terrible, but if you think about the idea that I'm in here and I'm in control, then you can become very fearful of what you do and of the consequences. You can become very arrogant. Uh, worst of all, you want stuff for me. This is mine. I'm going to have it. And we start to, right from quite early in childhood, bolster the, that self. That self that doesn't really exist. Bolster it. I'm, I'm clever. I'm stupid. I'm, I'm worthy. I'm unworthy. All these things that we attribute to ourselves and other people attribute to us us and we learn through our interactions with other people and then we start to protect this self because it's so frightening to let go of it and it's that that kind of greed um, that kind of fear the sort of feeling that I want this and if I don't get it I'll be unhappy and I don't want this and if I don't keep it away I'll be miserable and then as you get older and older it becomes bigger and more complex and then you have thoughts that you don't like and you try to push them away and you try to they're my thoughts and I'm so terrible for having these awful thoughts and oh. so I mean these are just among the many consequences I think so then that leads to the question, well, why are we like that? I mean, why did evolution make us this way? Or why does society make us this way? Or what is the origin of this illusion? And I think the origin of this is that what, what brains, what human beings and bodies are doing is trying to get around in the world. They construct a model of the world and a model of themselves in order to get around the world effectively. And that can't be very truthful. It can't bring in everything in such a complex organism as a human being. It's a simplified view. And that simplification, I think, leads to the idea of this mythical self who's inside mm -hmm. and whom we protect at our cost. So how does one come to the point where one realizes that the self is an illusion? Well, in my life there have been two ways of coming at it, and there may be other ways, but one way is, is through the science. And the neuroscience now is ever more doing what science has done for, for hundreds of years, demoting us from our, you know, we were thought we were the center of the universe, and then we thought, you know, we're the most important planet going around, um, you know, all, all the things that we've thought, um, and then discovering that our bodies are a mechanism, and now discovering a lot, a lot more to discover, but discovering a lot about how the brain works and what it's doing, and the more you understand that you know, this bit's making these kind of decisions and this bit's controlling that bit and this bit's constructing a body schema and a self-image and this bit's, you know, you think, well, but where am I? And, and, and as far as neuroscience is concerned, I am a construction that's made in various bits of the brain and that all sorts of other things are going on that aren't close to that. And the whole idea of there being a central self with consciousness that has consciousness and has free will, it, it becomes a myth. The other route is, is to become practiced at looking into the mind and the way it behaves. And that is a long, slow route. 
I sometimes think that in the future people will discover a quicker route. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, in my own experience and that of many, many people I know, it just takes a long time, years and years of meditation, just watching. And the first step is to calm the mind so that instead of poof, 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 this thought never go away, oh, mm, I want this thought, I don't want that thought, oh, ah, um, it all calms down and becomes much slower until gradually it's, a, it's possible to just see thoughts pop up and go away. And then natural questions arise, who's watching? And then looking into that and increasing depth and quietness. And out of that comes the same realization that what I thought was me with these powers and qualities and everything um, is an illusion. Pff, you know? What is the Cartesian theater? The Cartesian theater. This is the philosopher, American philosopher Dan Dennett. This is his term for uh, a kind of myth that a lot of scientists still have. So he points out in his famous or infamous 1991 book, Consciousness Explained, that almost all scientists and philosophers nowadays will reject Cartesian dualism. That's Descartes' idea of mind and, uh, and brain being quite separate. I mean, Descartes back in the 17th century, was really struggling to understand mind and brain and what is it. And he couldn't, he couldn't come to an answer then. So what he said was, well, there's physical stuff, you know, extended stuff, this, all this, but there's also mental stuff. And he couldn't work out how the two communicate. So he said they communicate through the pineal gland, which doesn't solve the problem at all. So as Dennett pointed out, Almost all scientists and philosophers reject that idea because it doesn't work. You can't answer how, how thoughts can affect brains or vice versa. Um, is it, so, so Cartesian dualism doesn't work. But, he said, and I think he's right, an awful lot of us still hang on to this idea that somehow there's a, a central meaner, he calls it, the one, the me inside you who, who, who has meaning, or the, the, the central controller, the... the the self who sits inside what he calls a Cartesian theatre, having the thoughts, seeing the mental imagery as though it were on a screen inside the head. Shut your eyes and imagine something. Doesn't it feel like this kind of, I'm here and I'm kind of imagining the pink elephant here? All that, he says, we have to throw that out as well. We have to throw out both the audience who would have been in the theatre and the theatre and the screen because none of them can be found in the brain and that's the only place there is to look for them, he says. So if the self is an illusion, does that mean that free will is also an illusion? I, I think it does. I think it does because <clears throat> the, the whole notion of free will is predicated on the idea that I have it. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> The whole notion of free will depends on the idea that there's a me who has this power. So I, a, a lot of the problem is that I'm always saying, well, what people naturally think about free will, and so we need to know what people think. But I've asked an awful lot of people, and, and so there have been various surveys and so on, and the gist is always, well, I can do something not because my brain tells me to do so, and the idea of my brain is kind of sets up a separate self as it is, but not because my brain um, tells me to do so, not because circumstances made it inevitable, not because of my genes or memes or anything else, it's because I want to. I can decide right now to hit my thigh, and I did it just because I want to. Well, if you actually look at what's going on, you're sat over there asking me difficult questions. There's a camera there. I'm sat here trying, this brain is trying to think how to answer the questions. Up comes the idea of time to demonstrate. What am I gonna do? I can't do very much pinned here, so slap the thigh. There's no magical power. It would be magic. If, if we look at what is happening in a brain and a body, it would be magic to say that I kind of intervened and made it happen independently of what all the neurons were doing and so on. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think free will is an illusion, but then what do you do about that? <laughs> does this tie in with Buddha's concept of uh, causes and conditions? Yes, I think it does. I, the, the Buddha was so extraordinary. I mean, in his time there was an awful lot of magic about. In, in the different cultures um, into which the ideas went, there were different kinds of magic, folk magic and tree spirits and ancestor spirits and all of these kinds of things and he kind of swept away 
a, a whole lot of it. And um, when he he tried, when he, yeah, I think, saw that everything happens because of what has happened before, that was really a revelation then. And it's a basic scientific insight. I mean, it is the fundamental basis of all the science we have, that, that, that things cause other things. Of course, it's incredibly complex, and you know, but basically, things don't happen because some mythical mind comes and makes them happen. They happen because of whatever happened before. So, yes, that's very much the case. But of course, in the time of the Buddha and in the languages in which the, his teachings have come to us, there wasn't the modern concept of free will. So you don't have in the suttas, you know, free will doesn't exist. But you do have these statements, like where you began with this. Actions exist and also their consequences, but the person who acts does not. In other words, the world is an evolving, um, ever-changing mass of causes and conditions. Um, and there isn't a kind of magical self who can intervene in things. Mm -hmm. So although it's all done in different language with a different context o over these millennia, I think it's fundamentally the same insight. Mm -hmm. And that leads to something very interesting in Buddhist training, not in all branches of Buddhism, cer certainly within Zen, um, the concept of not doing. I was absolutely horrified, you know, decades ago, um, in the early days of my um, Zen practice, um, I should point out I'm not a Buddhist, but I, I I don't sign up to a whole lot of stuff. Why don't you claim to be a Buddhist? Ask me that in a moment. Okay. Um, I was absolutely horrified um, when I was told that that the that a, a goal, if there if there are goals of meditation, is non meditation. What? You mean I'm expected to sit on this cushion with all the agony of all these terrible thoughts and all this for years and years and years only to come to a state of non-meditation? But I think that is is getting at the same thing, that with that practice, with that insight, with that loosening of the grip of self, it ceases to feel so much I am doing, and simply it becomes doing. And I think that's what that is about. Why I, I won't uh, be a Buddhist? Many reasons. I don't want to take the precepts which I feel are promises that I'm not confident I could keep and I don't want to make promises I can't keep. And I certainly don't want to sign up to beliefs. Um, my, my own original Zen teacher said, um, you know, it's not, it's not like that. You don't, you don't have to. But I, I feel very uncomfortable signing up to a whole lot of doctrine. I want to study things with an open mind and go with the evidence. That's very much in the in the, um, the way that the Buddha worked. I mean, he was open-minded, look into the mind, see how it is. Science is like that, or should be at its best. Open-minded, look for evidence, take your beliefs that way. So when I see Buddhists making great claims, like the um, Dalai Lama, a uh, couple of years ago, made a great statement which included, uh, Buddhists believe in reincarnation. If, if I had made myself a Buddhist and taken any vows or anything, I'd be horrified because that, you know, Buddhist belief, no, well, I don't, I, I, no. So there are many, many reasons and I, I feel much happier not, not signing up to that. But I'm very, very grateful for 35, however many years of Zen training that I've had and all the help of the teachers that have helped me, yeah. You've called yourself an atheist. What does that mean? I mean, of course we know what an atheist is, but what does it mean to you? Well, at its simplest, it's what the word means. Atheist, without God. I live my life without God. I do find myself sometimes, if something's awful, I think, oh, God, you know, or I might even go, oh, God, help me, if something, you know, if I feel really, oh, and I just laugh at myself and I think, universe, help me, calmness, insight, help me, whatever. Um, but to me, it means living without the prop, living without the, the, the structures of of um, the kind of religion I was brought up. I was brought up as a uh, ordinary Church of England Christian, and I'm pretty familiar with with Christian teachings. Um, I've read quite a lot of Islam and read the Quran and so on. Um, and I just don't, I, I I I don't have those things as part of my life, other than a kind of study out of interest of them. Mm -hmm. That does that does that answer what it means? In I my think life? so. Yeah, yeah, but. Considering all this, could you also call yourself a mystic, or would you not call yourself a mystic? It sounds slightly big-headed, doesn't it, to um, 
to say I'm a mystic. Why? I don't know. That's interesting, isn't it? It's like putting yourself on a pedestal in a way. But I have had, I have had quite a lot of what I would call another thing would call mystical experiences. So I suppose in that sense, I would say that I'm a mystic. Mm -hmm. But, but I'm not it? a mystic in the sense uh -huh. of sort of going around thinking, oh, you know, this is my life as a mystic and I'm doing this because I'm a mystic. Not, yeah. uh, not, none of that. What do you mean by mystical experience? The simplest ones. I can remember once when I was living in Germany, walking along and I came to a tree. And it was a very, very simple, undramatic experience of I was one with the tree and there wasn't anything else just treeness and it lasted quite a long time and I just did that with this tree mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the simplest simplest mm -hmm. but I've had more dramatic ones of where the dissolution of the self seems re really a dramatic thing and takes some time and everything changes and falls apart and um, then I've had I mean these names are difficult aren't they and I mean so I can I can tell you some stuff and you can make your own <laughs> thought about whether you're going to call it this experience or that experience mm -hmm. but um, experiences in which time and space no longer seem to hold the meanings that they did. Sometimes in deep meditation, particularly on long retreats where you've had some days to, to, to deepen the practice, um, where it kind of seems there's stuff happening, but it's not happening to anybody. And it's happening, so there must be change, which kind of implies time. But there doesn't really seem to be time in any normal sense or space in any normal sense. So very, I mean, how does one describe these things? I think mystical experiences very often take you out of comfortably being able to use the ordinary language you use. And that's part of what they are, the, 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 the falling away of the structures within which our normal lives of doing things and speaking uh, are held. Mm -hmm. um, difficult question. Right. Uh, many people assume that they are conscious. If you were to ask someone, are you conscious, they would say yes. And yet when a scientist uh, endeavors to find out what consciousness is, when, even when he tries to define it, the, the definition eludes him. What is your feeling about this? Uh, you know, I think underlying all the work that I've done on out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, psychedelic experiences, memes, evolution, and, every, uh, and all the books I've written on consciousness, ultimately the big questions are about what is consciousness, what is it, you know, what's this? Uh, th that's kind of, ah! And um, when, when you say that someone's conscious, I mean, if you ask me if I'm conscious now, there's one very simple sense in which I can answer that. Yes, this body here is alert and awake and, and alive and speaking and in that sense, objectively, it's conscious. But that, that's not problematic. The problematic idea is that I am conscious of you over there. And the natural kind of way we think about consciousness that I'm conscious now of that, but oh, I've only just noticed the, the sound of the fridge over there. <laughs> um, you know, oh, so I wasn't conscious of the fridge until that moment when I kind of cast around for it. And this leads to a whole lot of stuff about, well, there must be conscious and unconscious processes in the brain. And indeed, there are lots of um, scientists looking for the neural correlates of consciousness to try to find which bit of the brain or which process in the brain or, or, or whatever it is that gives rise to this thing called consciousness. I think that's all rubbish. I don't think it's like that at all. I think when, when we start to talk about I am, I am conscious of this and I am not conscious of that, we're inventing again the mythical self who would have these experiences and that can drop away in the kind of experiences we've been talking about and in the long-term practice of meditation that sense can drop away it can also go I mean I've done an awful lot of asking you know strange questions um, when I was teaching consciousness courses to university students I would get them every week I'd give them a question and tell them to go away and ask that question every day as many times as they can. It's extraordinarily difficult. People forget or well, they don't like doing it. Why don't they like doing it? Because it's threatening that self in there. But um, I was pretty ferocious. You do it, you do it, and come back and tell me what happens. And the first question always was, am I conscious now? And that is a fascinating question. Because if you ask any, are, are you conscious now? Yes. Okay. You always answer yes. 
then the interesting question comes, well, what about the rest of the time? I just mentioned that sound in the background there. Um, a lot of students then, if the, the ones who really worked at it, would come and say, oh, but it was kind of weird. The more I did it, the more it felt like whenever I asked the question, I became more conscious. I don't know if you had that feeling then. When I asked you, are you conscious now? You sort of hesitated. When I went, said yes. yes, I also didn't realize who the I was. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And it's a very strange thing. Some little shift happens. It was automatic. Uh, yeah. So my view on this is that what, one of the things that happens and bolsters the illusions is that whenever we ask about consciousness, whether it's asking am I conscious now or whether it's asking what is consciousness or anything of, of these this kinds, um, or we look around and go, oh, I'm here and I'm conscious of this amazing room and of you there, and, and then we jump, that's fine, but then we jump to the erroneous conclusion that it's always like that, and it isn't. So the next question I give the students and myself is, what was it like, what were you conscious of a moment ago? And that is a, I recommend having a go at that question because it's very, very weird. If I sit here now and go quiet and ask myself, what was I conscious of a moment ago? What will happen is something like this. Oh, I just had that shock. Oh, I had this feeling of my elbow on the chair and I had this sense that I'd been conscious of that for a while that it was perhaps a little irritating or something. That, but I wouldn't have thought of that if I hadn't asked myself the question, what was I conscious of a moment ago? And then, oh, the no noise of the fridge I've talked about. Oh, the feeling of my foot. I'm sort of pushing my foot on the floor in an odd way. It's quite a strong feeling of, the, of pressure. Was I conscious of that a moment ago? It sort of feels as if I was. Oh, and there's faint traffic out there in the road. That, again, I can sort of remember what... Was, now, I ask myself, well, which of these was I conscious of and which wasn't? They all seem to be different, separate things, and I don't know. Now, if I don't know which ones I was conscious of, then who does? So you, this can lead you to two completely different scientific views. One is, well, there must be an answer, mustn't there? And if I look inside the brain, I will find out what that answer is. Ah, oh, this, this bit, the, the noise of the fridge or the feeling of my foot on the... They were in the consciousness bit and I was conscious of them. And the other things weren't and I was just picking up bits of memory, whatever. But another much more challenging view, and I think this would fit with what I was saying about Dan Dennett, and it is certainly my view, is there is not an answer to what I was conscious of when I wasn't asking the question what I was conscious of before I started thinking, what am I conscious of? There were just multiple parallel things going on in the brain. The stuff going on in the frontal lobes, all the visual stuff going in on the visual brain, the temporal lobe th throwing memories in and out and organizing them, and the hippocampus doing spatial stuff, all these things going on. And it's only when I tell myself the story, ah, I'm conscious of this. Mm -hmm. And then we erroneously make a self a thing we're conscious of and assume it's like that all the time. And it's a massively wrong. So there's nothing enduring in there. There's all, all these processes going on. We have the illusion that there's something unifying, holding it together. Yeah, yeah. And if you so you started with Buddhism, uh, everything's impermanent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now this might get some people down to discover that there's no self, there's no free will, no consciousness. It could really make someone really pretty depressed. But as you go into it, you know, if there's no self, if there's no free will, if there's no consciousness, then Aren't you free? <laughs> <laughs> what a wonderful and very difficult question. There's three different answers I wanted to give there. When you say uh, you discover it, doesn't it depress you? Um, I think not. I think it's when somebody tells you it. You haven't found it out yourself. Someone's telling it. It's a sort of offensive. It's like, you know, how can you say I don't exist? Well, you know, uh, that's horrible. But when you discover it yourself, whether that's by... You know, some kids just have spontaneous mystical experiences. Um, adults do too, but um, or, or when you do long practice of meditation or mindfulness or prayer or other things, when you discover it for yourself, it's it's not so bad. Um, but um, what was the last bit of your question? Uh, um, it could also be quite freeing. Oh, well, what what is freedom? I think one of the one of the mistakes that we make is to think that free will gives us freedom. And I think what we really mean by free will is, is, is having lots of choices. 
and the more choices we have, the more freedom we have. It's, it's rather a more American thing, perhaps. Um, uh, we've got to be free. We've got to have all these these choices and and so on. Um, but that that really isn't freedom. Having to make endless choices and having to be responsible for them in in a certain kind of way is not freedom. Yes, seeing through, penetrating some of these illusions, um, I, I think yes, leads to a totally different kind of freedom. It's a freedom to be... I think to take this kind of freedom, you have to be able to pay attention and to be in the present and be alert and go with what things are and respond appropriately. That kind, that really feels free. Mm -hmm. That feels free of all the stuff that we had thrown on top of ourselves. Mm -hmm. But the reason I'm hesitating, that was a very complicated question, and in there you also said, when we discover that this doesn't exist and this doesn't exist, no, I'm not saying these things don't exist. I'm saying they're illusions, and that's very different. An illusion, even if you look in the dictionary, an illusion is not something that doesn't exist. It's something that's not what it seems to be. So cells exist. They're, they're things constructed, in my opinion. They're, they're structures made up by brains that have some they have consequences um, and they have they have functions um, they're useful in certain ways but they are not what they seem to be a self is an ephemeral thing that comes and goes is built up and dissipates comes and goes again it, and it's never quite the same the next time it comes up it's, it's it's a bit different it's fluid and impermanent so it's not what it seems to be and I would say the same about consciousness mm -hmm. there's this ah what is it there's this black colour, there's this, my hands, you know, the, the, there's something. When we start to make false theories, we get into a great muddle about it. But I wouldn't say there's nothing there, there's something there, but we're mistaken in the way that we think about consciousness. Mm -hmm. So if self, free will and consciousness are illusions, um, what is it that is born and what is it that dies? bodies are born. Bodies are wet, squishy, amazing, evolved, uh, fantastic organisms, uh, machines, uh, you know, wet, squishy machines with incredible things going on in them. They're born out of their parents from a long line of genetic modification going back um, to the beginning of life on Earth. And, and, and that body dies it, when all the homeostatic mechanisms that keep it alive cease to work. Um, it's gone. If you add that to that, the idea that I was born, not I, this thing, I, the conscious me inside, and I'm going to die, and then you become frightened, oh, I'll die, you know, that's all that. That's, and that's a source of pain and suffering. Because if you see through these things, I mean, for goodness sake, if there's nobody in here, nobody permanent in here, nobody in control, then there's, there's nobody to die. I think even more, even more interesting to me is to think about the notion, you know, I really can't bear the, the kind of popular notion of reincarnation because it's completely against what the, the Buddha taught. After all, the Buddha taught no self or self is impermanent. And, and people seem to love the idea that, oh, you know, I'll, I'll survive the death of the body and then I'll get into another body and, you know, <laughs> whatever. Um, a, a, an utterly different way of interpreting the idea of no longer being bound by cycles of, of birth and death and rebirth is if you can really feel and be happy with, content with, the notion that the self is ephemeral and coming and going, then you can see that this coming and going is the false idea is that every time a self comes back and I go, oh, am I conscious now? Oh, this is me, I'm the same me. If you falsely make that the same me, that's something you can cling on to. But if you see that every so often in the day, from, for some people and some days, lots of times, some people, some days, you just kind of go through the day without kind of being alert at all. But if you can see that, oh, sometimes a self comes up as a bit different from the previous self, it's another ephemeral construction and let it go and let it arise again and let it go, then this thing is no longer bound. No longer bound by the false idea that it's got to be hung on to and that it's permanent and that it's terrifying if it dies when the body dies. Mm -hmm. So I would say as long as a body like this one here is, is functioning well, um, 
selves pop up and dissipate and come and go and people attribute things to it and so on and so on but there's nothing permanent inside there that is to be feared when the body dies. Mm -hmm. The Buddha talked about uh, that which is born and he also talked about that which can be we can have release from that which is born. He talked about the unborn. What is the unborn? <laughs> Do you know I, I, I feel like um, you're asking me these questions as though I really know the answers, <laughs> and I'm kind of coming over like I. But now you hit you now you hit me with one. I'm just going to say, you really think I know? I mean, I, I, I'll do my best. Um, this relates to a lot of koans, like you know, what was my face before my mother and father were born, and these kinds of things. Um, I don't know what the unborn is, but I think it has something to do with. If you have the sense of stuff appearing, arising, falling away impermanently, a natural question that comes then in quietness, a very simple question, is where is it coming from? And when, as, I, as we talked about earlier, when, when space and time no longer have the, the, the sort of firm sense that they do, um, and there's just stuff, where is it coming from? Um, maybe that's the unborn? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, in, in my view, the, the Buddha must have laid some, a lot of importance on the now. I mean, the only thing that, that really exists for us is, is, is the now, you know, not the past, not the future, there's just the now. The now can be kind of undefinable, but um, could you tell us what the now means for you? I wrote about this in, in, in my book, Zen and the Art of Consciousness, which is a collection of ten questions that I ha had a go at. And I, I started mindfulness practice, I was suddenly hit by the concept of mindfulness back in 1986. And that just, I was kind of propelled into deep practice of mindfulness for some weeks. And I felt that I knew then, I was told that this was something to do with being in the now. And that's what I practiced, intensely, with some effect and it was many years decades later that further looking into or further further mindfulness practice never as intense as it was in those weeks back then but on and off mindfulness practice which I thought was being in the now it, I, I think there isn't a now I think if, if, if you were really really mindful to the so it feels as though it's the past and present are, are going away and there's deep attention to this. It seems may seem at first that this is kind of sliding thing of there's the past and the present, the past and the future and this kind of, you know, but that goes away as well. And then, then what? I don't know. You're, you're very good at this. You're, you will start with some questions I can answer and you're coming to all these dreadful ones now and I can't. <laughs> I don't know. But I certainly came to the thought that there, there really isn't a now in the conventional sense that we think about now. No, there's no, there's no such thing. So what I thought that I really understood, you know, after a lot of practice, what mindfulness was, I decided I didn't really have a clue anymore. Which was a bit discomforting at the time. <laughs> it's also quite honest. Yeah. I try to be honest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay. Sue, thank you so very much. <laughs> thank you for your difficult questions. <laughs>